Christianity is not about being good, but about realizing that we can never be good. That is the first thing you understand in Christianity. And that is why we need Jesus. Today, sadly, thousands of churches are denying the gospel with an alternative. It has nothing to do with Christianity. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the... The foundation of our Christian faith is the blood of Jesus. Our gospel is a gospel of blood. Without this blood, the New Testament or the gospel, they mean nothing. And yet, there are so many who hate the blood of Jesus. They find this whole narrative of the crucifixion offensive. They find it scandalous. They call it butchery. Why does there have to be this whole gory concept of crucifixion? Why can't we have Christianity without the blood? Have we understood it? Why? Why this blood? But more than all, it is the devil. From the beginning, the devil has been against the blood of Jesus. And he knows that he cannot defeat the blood. Jesus bruised him on the cross and destroyed him. But one thing the devil can do is to corrupt the truth about the blood. Every time there is an attempt to change the truth about the blood of Jesus, it leads to some form of idolatry. For example, the teaching of transubstantiation, where they say that when the priest blesses the bread and the wine, that bread and wine it's literally converted into the body and the blood of Jesus. That is unscriptural. But then there is another teaching which moved into the Reformed Church. And that is consubstantiation. Where they say the bread and wine still remain bread and wine. But it is spiritually transformed into the body and the blood of Jesus. This also is not what the Bible says. Jesus said, do it in remembrance of me. It's purely symbolic. It is important that we keep the truths about the cross as Jesus intended it to be. No, I don't think we have fallen into that error. But then there is another error. How? The blood of Jesus has been isolated from Calvary, separated from the cross, and it's treated separately like a magical substance. Like drawing cash from a cash machine and then taking it and using it anywhere. And there are so many people who separate the blood from the cross. And they pray, oh, wash me in your blood, wash me in your blood. There's nothing wrong in that prayer. But what is wrong in that prayer is when you isolate it from the cross. There's a song we sing, wash me, O Lamb of God, wash me from sin. But there, it's so clearly mentioned in that song, by thine atoning blood, not just blood. Let the crimson tide shed from your wounded side. That song is Referring to the cross, we must always connect the blood to the cross. The blood by itself means nothing. Some people say, oh God, cover me under your blood. Cover me. Some people, you know, when they're, tr when they're in trouble, what they do? They plead the blood. Blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong. But why is that blood powerful? Always remember, this is the blood of the cross. I remember many years ago, in the early part of my ministry, I once visited a home where there was a lot of problem. 
the constant quarrels. And the lady minister who was with me, the sister, she had her own idea of how to handle these things. So she said, bring me a cup of water. And she put her hand on the water and prayed over it and magically turned it into the blood of Jesus. Then she went from room to room sprinkling that water. For some Christians, such rituals are attractive. It appears very powerful. But nothing really changed except that they needed to mop up the place a bit. What gives power to the blood is the death of Jesus. Of course, it was precious blood. It is God's blood. There's so many things beautiful about the blood of Jesus. But if that blood intrinsically by itself had magical powers, then the people crucifying Jesus, the soldiers who came so close, some blood would have splashed on them. But nothing happened. Because there is nothing in that blood as a substance. When you treat it as a substance by itself, that is another form of idolatry. May God speak to us therefore today through this word, boldness by the blood of Jesus. Father, we pray that you may fill hungry hearts today. Speak to us that we may be able to listen and Holy Spirit grant understanding to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. So I really hope you're ready for some heavy stuff. So we're going to begin with the New Living Translation. I'd like to therefore call your attention to the epistle to the Hebrews with the assumption that it is St. Paul who wrote this. We'll turn to Hebrews chapter 9 and begin with verse 6 and verse 7. When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The theme of this chapter is blood. There is no other chapter in the whole Bible that covers blood like this. Surely, Paul has something very important to tell us in this chapter. This chapter is giving us a protocol, telling us how we can approach God. You should know by now this is my favorite topic. God is my passion. And approaching Him, loving Him, worshipping Him, being reconciled to Him, that is the purpose of the gospel. The ultimate goal of Christianity is to reconcile the lost sinner with God. But that is impossible. It has always been known that God is unapproachable. If you read 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. Who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto. Uh, Paul is saying that God only has immortality. Meaning, once upon a time man had it. You see, when God made man, he made him immortal. Death did not exist as man was sinless. But the moment man sinned, he lost his immortality. Now he was a mortal being. Death was real. Sin and death separated man from God. Man left the realm of light and now man lives in darkness. He cannot approach the light where God dwells. If man can't even gaze at the sun, let alone approach the sun, he will be burned to a crisp. How can this man approach God? How can this sinner live eternally with God? Now some may find this part of theology 
a little confusing, a little distressing. They may say, you always preach that God is a loving father. But then suddenly you say he's consuming fire. How can he be both? Now, in case you still have a question like that, I'm going to answer it now. But please remember this answer. Bear it in your soul that you may know God correctly. Suppose there is a father who has a two-year-old daughter. He greatly loves her and he adores her. One day, he notices this girl is holding something in her hand. It is a syringe that has been used by a drug addict who has many diseases. And this girl is now holding this. She has no idea how dangerous, how deadly it is. And she looks at it. She's playing with it carelessly. She is going to pierce herself with that. You tell me, as a normal human being, what do you expect the father to do? I'll tell you. I expect the father to sit on his chair and say, Darling, honey, hello, that's not good for you. Don't touch it. Is that what a father will do? What do you expect a father to do? I'll tell you. I expect the father to fly in a fit of fury, to pounce upon that syringe, to violently pluck it from a hand and fling it as far as possible. And in the process, maybe he may hurt her. Maybe he may turn to her with that fury on his face and scream at her. All that is possible. Why? This anger of the father is a proof that he loves his child. The consuming fire of God is a proof that he is our father and he loves us. Because he knows what that syringe of sin can do. He is consuming fire and anger not against us. But against that syringe in our hand. Against that sin that we love. And in the process of dealing with that sin, probably we will feel a bit of that fire. Fathers, you know, you will turn back to the girl. And what are you going to say? Where did you get that? Who gave it to you? Why did you touch it? And this baby girl is looking at daddy and saying, what happened to him? Why is he having a fit? Why is he throwing a tantrum? Something is wrong with this man. I thought he was loving. I this is how Christians talk about God. He's a loving father, but why is he having a fit? Why is he so angry? Baby Christians do not understand the wrath of God. So I hope this is really deep in your heart. So here we are. Divided by, from God by sin. The mortal has been divided from the immortal. The children have been divided from their father. And we are all born in this separation. We are born with this gap in our heart. And from birth, we are fitted with a homing device. By nature, instinctively, there's something in us is longing for God because we are missing him. We know we have been separated from him. And that is why if you read the Bible, the Bible is full of people trying to worm their way back to their maker. In Genesis, we read about how man built a tower. He wanted to build it to heaven. This is man's own method to reach his destiny. And then all through the Bible, man for thousands of years has been trying and trying and trying. Today, there are religions, religious people who are trying different methods. These are their attempts to come close to God. But all these attempts have not brought man any closer to God. Of all the religious people, the worst is the religious Christian. Several generations of very good religious Christians thought that their goodness gave them 
the right to approach God. They boldly entered the church. They boldly sat down. They boldly stood up and they prayed aloud. They boldly testified. Where did they get this boldness from? Their boldness came from their own goodness. Like the Pharisee, he boldly entered the temple. He walked right up to the front thinking he was close to God there. He didn't know he was much farther away from God even than the publican. But what gave him the boldness? His own goodness. And like this Pharisee, many Christians have brought up their children in the way they have understood Christianity. They force their children to be good. They force little girls to cover their heads. They force them to close their eyes and to pray and worship a God they do not know. They force them with threats of beatings and punishment. They force them to comply with certain form, a system of rules. And the child grows up knowing that this is how I must behave. The child doesn't know God. The parents do not know God. All that they know is a system. But here is the news for all such parents and all such Christians around the world. All along, these people never knew that they were never Christians. Christianity is not about being good but about realizing that we can never be good. That is the first thing you understand in Christianity. And that is why we need Jesus. Today, sadly, thousands of churches are denying the gospel with an alternative. It has nothing to do with Christianity. Jesus said in John 10, 1, he said, I am the door. This is the only way. If somebody finds another way, he is a thief and a robber. He can be a preacher. He can be a priest. He can be a high priest, a most high priest. He can be a rabbi. He can be a great man in the eyes of men. But in the eyes of God, he's a thief. The man who doesn't preach the gospel, he's a robber. He is not a Christian. Think of all the names that I have been repeating over the past four years. St. Paul, St. Augustine, Martin Luther, John Wesley. What is common in all these people is they were religious Christians. They were righteous men who did the right things. But they did not know Jesus. But thank God they realized their depravity, and they discovered Jesus. John Wesley was attending church, doing ministry, preaching for over 20 years, but he did not know Jesus. But he realized something was wrong with him. And little by little, he came to a place where he was about to quit Christianity because he was totally disappointed because Christianity was weak. There was no power in it. But after 23 years of living in this darkness, God brought him into a knowledge of Christ. But today, there are so many who think they are doing the right thing. I remember in the early days of my Christianity when I was still a teenager, one sister told me she would lean against the wall then she would close her eyes and then she would empty her mind, shut her mind from everything else and just keep saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. She knew that I was a brand new Christian and she was teaching me something which today I would say it sounds like new age mysticism. This is not Christianity. How many people are going to discover a shocking truth at the end of their lives when Jesus looks at them and says, I never knew you. I ask you, why do you think you are a Christian? Because you attend a Christian church? Because you worship God? Because you know the Bible? Because you read the Bible? Because you pray? Lies upon lies, 
They have deceived millions of Christians with lies. This is why I am so passionate about the gospel. We need to understand what sin has done to us. Sin has separated all mankind from their father, their God who loves them. Sin has brought the division. We cannot approach this God now because we are sinners. We are born in that gap, in that separation. We are hurt by that gap and that gap is called death. There is nothing we can do about it. Nothing is going to change in a billion years no matter what you do. But then, does God intend for the separation between Him and mankind forever? No, never. God loves us and He wants us back. It is with this whole thing of approaching God that Paul begins Hebrews 9. I was amazed as I read this chapter. In Hebrews 9, Paul begins to explain the tabernacle of all things. So let me ask you a question before I continue. We have all heard about the tabernacle. Am I right? Can you tell me what was the purpose of the Old Testament tabernacle? The simple and the main purpose that the tabernacle is all about God showing the way for man to approach him. Think of that little girl and the syringe. If you're a father, think of what that syringe could do to that girl. It will kill her. Now just imagine you delayed. As a father, you delayed. Or you somehow couldn't pluck that syringe away and she injected herself. Straight away it entered a bloodstream and the effect was instant. And within a few seconds that girl dies. How distraught will your heart be as a father? This is what happened in the garden. God had won. But that innocent yet foolish man took that syringe, played with it, hurt himself, and now death has entered. Sin has cut us away from God and sin makes it impossible for us to approach this holy God. The rest of Hebrews 9 is telling us the law, the protocol by which a sinful man can approach the holy God. It is with this purpose in mind to somehow get this lost man back that God separated the Jews unto himself. But even these separated Jews, they could not approach him in the tabernacle. They could only stand around the tabernacle. Then among the Jews, God separated a group of people called Levites. But even they couldn't approach God. But then amongst them, God separated a group of priests. And he said, you can enter the tabernacle. So when they entered the first part of the tabernacle called the outer court, they performed certain ablutions, certain um, rituals of washing. They washed themselves, they cleansed themselves, and then they entered what is called a holy place. But even these cleansed priests were not clean enough to enter that inner sanctum, the most holy place in the tabernacle. So the priests are not just Ordinary people, they are separated from the Jews, from the Levites. They are cleansed, they are consecrated, but even they can only stop. They can stop in the holy place, perform their various duties and go back. What is God trying to say by this? He's trying to say all your rituals, your religion is not enough. You cannot approach me with your religious ceremonies and your washings and your cleansings. Now I want to talk to you about this, the most holy place. Imagine in your head, okay? There's a big place like this hall. It's an open thing with a, there's no roof. But there's a big box that has been partitioned into two. The first place is where the priests would go. But the second place is called the most holy place or the 
in our sanctuary. I want to talk to you about this place. Between the holy place and that most holy place was a curtain, according to God's command. Now this curtain, God asked for this curtain to be made very, very thick. It was so thick, they say, that even horses couldn't pull it apart. If horses pulling the curtain couldn't tear it, surely no man could tear it. What is the purpose for God asking for a curtain so thick? We are all familiar with curtains. We would never make a curtain so thick. Two things. One, you all know when you enter a closed room with a door and another door on the other side, when you open this door and shut this door, what will happen to the other door? The wind will push it open. Now, there's no door, just a curtain. Every time the priests enter the holy place, that curtain would sway. And God said it shouldn't sway. Heavy, thick curtain. Secondly, this curtain should never tear. So no man can tear it. So get the picture. Why is God taking care to put a curtain where the Gentiles can't come, the Jews will not come, even the Levites will not come. Why? It was so that the priests would not look at him. In the hierarchy of the Old Testament, the priests were the saintliest of people. They were the best among them. But God said, I do not want them to look into the most holy place. Why would they? Because the priests were the cleanest of all. And they would presumptuously think, because I'm a clean person, I have the right. They, the priests, are the dangerous people. The sinner will tremble. The publican trembled. But the Pharisee who trusted his own cleanness felt he had the right to go to the front. The priests are just like that. The priests, they are the most religious people. And it is to prevent them. From looking in to conceal the glory from them, God asked for a thick curtain. If any priest became curious, he would die. It is to protect him that this curtain is so thick. So in this sense, this place in that inner sanctuary was the most dangerous place in the world. No light could enter. Absolute thick darkness as we read in 1 Kings 8. And there, in that darkness, was the dwelling place of God. Now, all this makes us feel terrified of God. Terrified of that place. But only if we know the truth of God through the gospel will we understand this correctly. It's like that two-year-old girl talking to you, crying and saying, I'm really scared of my father. He plucked that syringe violently from my hand. I'm scared of my dad now. What would you say? No, your dad loves you. That's the gospel. To make that sinner understand why God is like this. So let's look at the inner sanctum in a different way. I've told you what the inner sanctum is from the perspective of the approaching man. But let me tell you from God's angle. This holiest of all, the holy of holies, the most holy place, also known as the inner sanctuary, it was the closest that a holy God could come to a sinful man. As I meditated on just this line, it humbled me so much and I realized how little I know about the holiness of God. This inner sanctum, when we look at it from the wrong angle, it looks like God is trying to stay away from us. No! That inner sanctuary is a proof that God is trying to reach out to us. He wants us, otherwise he would have been up in heaven. Even in the Old Testament, God came down. His glory dwelt in that inner sanctum. It shows his heart. 
when this little girl grows up and somebody talks to her and put sense into her, her her head and say do you know your father violently plucked that syringe from your hand because he loves you as she understands she will look at her father she will embrace her father and say daddy thank you i'm so grateful for your zeal for holiness for your zeal against my sin only one man in the whole world was allowed to enter that sacred space and we all know who it was it was the high priest and he was allowed to enter that place only one day in the year it's called yom kippur or the day of atonement he would enter that place in other words this is entering the presence of god entering the place where the glory of god dwelt now what gave him the right to enter because he had special clothes because he was a special man the high priest because of his consecration because god appointed him the only reason why this man could enter this place it is because he had blood in his hands the blood of an innocent animal gave him those precious moments of mercy to meet with god in that sacred space just for those few moments it was a tremendous occasion you see this day of atonement was a very very important day for all the jews it was their annual convention and it was far more than that you see this high priest was their representative when the high priest entered the tabernacle all the jews began to tremble because they knew the truth about what was happening when this man like a diplomat entered the tabernacle and was going to come face to face with god he was representing all the jews before god whatever happened to him it meant it was happening to them if god received him it means he was receiving them but if god rejected this man it meant he was rejecting all the jews together so the people were waiting outside anxiously frightened wondering if the blood in his hands the blood of the covenant would be accepted by god if everything passed off peacefully all of them would smile and be relieved because now their sins would be passed over for another year just for one year and that is why tradition says it's not clearly mentioned in the bible but they say that when the high priest entered that most holy place on that day he would have bells on his clothes and a rope tied to one foot now i'm not saying this is doctrine i'm not saying this is true but tradition has it that way because in case this man is rejected by god he will die instantly in that most holy place and no one can enter in and pull his body so the rope would be held by a priest in the holy place while the high priest entered and in case he died he would have to pull him out with the rope well i don't know if that is true but the fact is it makes us understand how grave this whole thing was now with all this why could not this system bring people close to god this entire system of the old testament failed for several reasons i'll just briefly tell you first of all this high priest himself he was a sinner so before entering this place on this day he did this he had to kill a bull take its blood and enter this place now he was atoning for his own sins and the sins of his family then he would come out of that most holy place and finely ground fragrant incense would be offered to god two goats would be taken he would lay his hands on one goat confess all the sins of the people and send that goat away the other goat would be killed and its blood would be taken into that place this is the second time he's entering that most holy place on that same day 
Paul says. This entire thing was merely a figure or a shadow of the real thing. Hebrews 9.9, 9, the New, New Living Translation, Hebrews 9.9. 9. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. Okay. The biggest failure in the Old Testament system was in the blood. The blood itself failed. You just read quickly Hebrews 10.4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. But I want to make you understand because these are important things. I'll tell you, I wish I could stop preaching and start worshipping and start jumping because my heart is leaping within me as I understand these truths. You see, animal sacrifices can never completely deal with human sin. There is something really missing. Yes, when the animal sacrifice was offered and the blood sprinkled, God did forgive man. But there's something missing in that forgiveness. This was merely a judicial forgiveness and it was not a removal of guilt from people's hearts. Suppose one of you in a moment of covetousness. Now, you've heard that there is a scheme. It's a scam. But you can make 100,000 euros. Quick money and nobody will know. You know it's wrong. But then nobody will know and God understands your need. You are in debt. You need a house. You need so many things. So you agree to the fraud. And instead of getting cash, you get caught. Either six months in prison or you pay a huge fine. Now imagine somebody has agreed to pay your fine, and they pay your fine. So you are cleared now judicially. The legal requirement is gone. You've paid. You come home. Can you look into the face of your wife? There is guilt in your heart. Can you face your colleagues at work like normal? And then come to church on Sunday. Will you worship God? Hallelujah! I'm so happy. Why? Because somebody paid your fine? But what about the sin that you committed? That guilt will remain. No matter if someone pays. The payment clears you judicially, but the guilt remains in your heart. So, even though you have been cleared outwardly, your conscience is tormenting you like a vulture pecking at meat. And you will never feel that full and final forgiveness. This was the kind of cleansing that the Old Testament Jews received by the offering of animal blood. They could not jump and shout and say, I am forgiven. No more consciousness of my sins. That could never happen. There was no permanent purging from the guilt in the Old Testament. So this day of atonement did not accomplish total forgiveness. The fact that this had to be repeated annually is evidence that the previous year's sacrifice had failed. So the sins of the waiting people, they were covered but not cleared not cleansed. After explaining this in the first half of Hebrews 9, Paul now begins to explain the superiority of the real thing. He says all that happened in the Old Testament is a shadow of the real thing. And then he goes on to explain the superiority. I don't want to burden you with details, but I need you to know the truth. Hebrews 9.11 so Christ has now become the high priest. Okay. The first thing that changes in the new system is that not a man, but Jesus himself becomes our high priest. That's the first difference. The second thing is the high priest in the Old Testament was only for people of a certain nationality. Imagine, you now we have Brother David sitting here, and the gospel is that Jesus has chosen him and the Romanians and all of us. If they show kindness to us, we can receive, you know, maybe fragments of the blessing. 
That is how it was in the Old Testament. No other nation except the Jews. But thank God, Jesus has become the high priest, not only of the Jews, but of the whole world. That is why he is our high priest too. So two things. First, Christ is the high priest. Secondly, a high priest for the whole world. Then, number three. Have you read the whole verse yet? Carry on. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands. Okay. He entered not into an earthly sanctuary, but into the most holy place in heaven, into the presence of God for us. All this is contained in verse 11. Then read verse 12. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves. Okay. He... Not the blood of goats and calves. See, the, if you want to understand the Old Testament cleansing, just remember your financial scam. You come into God's presence and you sit as a guilty sinner and you will never be happy. And that is how so many Christians are today. They come to church, but they're not happy. They're always burdened about their sin. They don't know what to do. The reason is because the gospel of the new covenant is not being preached. They are still preaching the Old Testament. And that is why the cleansing is also just merely superficial. It is ceremonious and it is not the cleansing of the conscience. So here Paul is saying, this blood is not the blood of an animal that can perform only a peripheral work. But Jesus, our high priest, entered the presence of God in eternity before God himself with his own blood carry on he entered the most holy place once for all time once for all time and secured our redemption forever forever you see in the old testament the moment the high priest exited the most holy place said, oh thank god now till next year i am safe but the next year the burden would come back Every year. But here it's eternal redemption. Now, I want to tell you the most important thing. The difference between the old and the new systems. You read verse 13 and verse 14. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. The old system did this. It paid your fine and sent you home. You went home judicially cleared of what you have done but you went home as a guilty sinner. You will be tormented every day by your past and you will never be cleared. That's what the old system did. But the blood of Jesus does not clear you just legally, but it touches the sinner's conscience. Do you know the purpose of the conscience? The conscience is that built-in device that will never lie. Why is a lie detector so successful, so powerful? It's because of human conscience. We can fool the whole world, but our conscience will tell the truth. So if you have sinned, your conscience will always smite you. So that's why you'll always feel that guilt and guilt. But here, the blood of Jesus is dealing with the conscience. How? It silences the conscience? Is that it? No. This is the superiority of the blood, which I want to explain as we go on, how we get a full and complete forgiveness. But first thing, the moment Jesus, as our high priest, took his own blood and entered the most holy place in the presence of God, and the moment he secured our eternal redemption for us, at that moment, the first person to react was God himself. That thick curtain, which horses could not pull apart, that tore. Two things you are to be noticed. One, it is torn from top to bottom. Now, this curtain was so high that no man could tear it. And if at all, the Hulk walked in and he ripped the curtain, 
he, any man would rip it from bottom to top. But the fact that it tore from top to bottom shows this is not a man. Only God could have done it. But that is not the only significance of the curtain tearing. Something huge was happening at that moment. It means the entire system of the Old Testament is come to an end. That is the significance of the curtain tearing. You see in Hebrews 9, 8, what he says. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place. The entrance to the most holy place. Was not freely open. It is not open. As long as the tabernacle and the system it represented was still in use. See, God didn't just say, okay, now the cross has made a way for you all. Why did he go and tear that curtain? He was putting an end to the Old Testament system. Because as long as that system stands... You will not enter my presence. You will not enjoy my presence. You will not come in and be free. Do you know what that curtain tearing therefore represents? That system of hierarchy broke down and you and I, we are all the same. I am no different from you. Because I'm standing here and preaching, it doesn't mean I'm better than you. I am more spiritual than you. I have a better place in heaven than you. It means nothing of that sort except that God has given me the gospel to share with you. But you are now the same as me. You don't need to feel inferior. You don't need to feel lesser than the preacher. The other thing is, as Paul says, no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Which means, on one hand, there's no difference between you and the priest. On the other hand, there's no difference between you and the vilest sinner. In other words, when the Old Testament system came to an end, all of mankind have equal access to God. This is why God brought us out of the Old Testament system. If God has been working in your heart and he has been bringing you out of the past or maybe it's a church, or maybe it's a system, or maybe it's an understanding, but you realize you were living in the old covenant. Why did God bring you out? He could have kept you there and blessed you with a new covenant. No, the curtain must tear. The old covenant must come to an end. And in bringing us out, God says, I am starting a new work in your life. So if the gospel has been working in your understanding, if it has been changing you, it means God has ripped that curtain and he's now inviting you in. So all that Jesus did in the presence of the Father is now being applied to you through the Holy Spirit. Now I'm coming towards the end, but I have something very important to speak about the blood of Jesus. You see, all that Jesus did on the day of atonement, he did it for us, but it didn't do a work in us. And that is why Paul's theology of the blood, it really means a lot to us. So I'm not going to read in the verses, but I'll tell you the verses. If you're noting them now, that's fine. But here it is. Romans 5.9 tells us we are justified by faith in the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 1.7 says we have redemption through the blood of Jesus. Colossians 1.20 says we have peace with God through the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 2.13 says we are made nigh by the blood. It is an action entirely of God. Hebrews 9.14, our conscience is purged by the blood. If you are not enjoying freedom in your conscience, you haven't understood the gospel. If you're feeling burdened and guilty, you haven't understood the gospel. Quite often, you're conscious that your heart still desires sin. And you may be still committing some sin. And you feel the blood of Jesus doesn't have power. The gospel doesn't have power. I am still a sinner. My friend, you haven't understood the gospel. You need to understand that when Jesus is cleansing you with his blood, it doesn't mean you will not sin again. It doesn't mean you are changed completely. No. It means God has accepted you because you can never approach God as a guilty sinner. But now you can approach God 
What has the blood of Jesus done for us? It has given us the right to approach God. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The title of my message today is Boldness by the Blood of Jesus. I told you how awesome, awful the presence of God is in that inner sanctum, in that darkness that not even a Jew or a Levite or a priest or even the high priest can enter that place. God's holiness, dreadful, and yet by the blood of Jesus, I don't just enter, but I can enter boldly into the presence of God. What gives me that boldness? The big mistake churches have made is they have mixed the two. Yes, the blood of Jesus cleansed me, and my boldness comes because I'm a cleansed person. Your boldness comes from your own righteousness, your boldness comes because you are good. Who said you're good? We turn everything into idolatry if we don't understand the blood. We say, I humble myself, I confess my sin, now I'm obedient to the Lord. And what do we do? We turn our obedience into an idol. Your boldness does not come from your own righteousness, your own goodness. My friend, it comes by the blood of Jesus. If you've understood the blood, you worship the Lord, you're so happy, you go back. And your heart is tempted by sin. And you feel tempted. Now of course, the Bible clearly tells us what sin is. The syringe. It warns us, don't sin. God is very angry with sin. But and if you sin. Does anything change in your relationship with God? That little girl and her father. She will always be daddy's girl. No matter what. What has the blood of Jesus done? If I sin, that blood has given me a person to whom I can run. It has given me a safe place. That sacred space, that terrifying place, it's now my place. And I can go there. I can talk to him. I can share with him. And I'll tell you, this means so much to me. When you realize the gospel and how he loves you, you will jump, you will dance, you will worship God. I'll tell you, it is so beautiful when you come into the light of this experience. 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, but the condition is walking in the light. So I thought, okay, so I have to always be in the light only then. The, why, why are we afraid of the light? It's because we don't know the gospel. It's because we are still in the old covenant that most holy place is full of darkness. But when you come into the gospel, you now are approaching God who dwells in, in, in light and immortality. But that's brought to light through the gospel. Oh, because of the gospel, because of the cross, because of Jesus. Now I have the boldness, even though I'm a sinner, I can enter into the presence of God and say, my father, this is who I am. And he will listen. He will understand. But then, as Paul speaks of the blood, little by little, the blood of Jesus begins to deal with our sin. Hebrews 13, 12 tells us the blood sanctifies us. Revelation 7, 13, garments are washed and made white in the blood. And finally, Revelation 12, 11, we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb. What is common to all these verses I have just mentioned as part of Paul's theology? They are all verses about the blood. So it is telling us about the profound ministry that Jesus is doing as our great high priest. Not only justifying us, but he's sanctifying us also through the blood. The presentation of the blood is an essential part of our reconciliation to God. And this offering was once and for all. One last question before I finish. Why? Why blood? Why can't God just forgive sin? It's like a stumbling block to so many progressive Christians. They have changed the gospel. They're saying that Calvary is not necessary for God to forgive. So my question is, why blood? God made this arrangement from the beginning. 
that we might know what this whole thing has cost him. Jesus didn't come with a bottle from heaven with blood to cleanse us. No. It was the blood in his own body that we might know the cost of sin. You see, we are often like little children. You know, Daddy works hard night and day. He collects some money and then he goes and buys something for the child. And when he gives it, what does the child do? Break it or kick it. The child has no idea about the price paid by, by the father. And so often we are like little children. We treat the cross like a toy. We treat the whole gospel like something small. This is the heartbeat of the New Testament. This is the heartbeat of God. We need to understand the price paid in this covenant of grace where he gives everything and we pay nothing. But let us realize what it cost him. Dear friend, do not forget there is blood on the paperwork. Shall we all stand? Okay, we are going to worship him. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or even the victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Father, Father, we don't understand everything, but may this gospel pierce the hearts of all the listeners. Let it spread throughout the world. Bring churches out of that old covenant. Tear that curtain down. Oh, let preachers everywhere preach about the Father. Let them preach the gospel once again. Send a revival in this planet again, oh God. And help us as a little group to love you, to be grateful to you, to worship you. Bless your people in Jesus' name. Now may the grace of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all until Jesus returns in glory. Amen.